Hello traders, I'm Andrew Anderson. This is the Nomad Capital Report from Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, NomadCapitalist.com, the website. And, uh, oh boy, is there a lot to, uh, a lot to talk about today. The U.S. government is shut down. Well, part of it, at least. And uh, we're going to get to that. It is a crazy time with uh, all the mud slinging in Washington. And it's, um, let me tell you, it has never been a more enjoyable time to be watching from afar. Uh, I, uh, I, I travel all around. I have not uh, spent much time in the U.S. lately, really any time. But I, it has never hit me as much as it has right now. Uh, just how entertaining it must have been for the rest of the 95% of the world all those years to watch the U.S. Uh, on its gradual and now not so gradual descent into uh, irrelevance. And uh, <laughs> let me tell you, I'm here uh, about 8,000 miles away and uh, I don't have to deal with the, uh, the shutdown. Uh, I don't have to... Uh, worry about not getting my tax refund check or uh, having to call the government agency. I, uh, Of course, as you know, I have no desire to call my congressman. No desire to do any of that. So here I am. This is the benefit. Uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm watching with glee. But I must say that um, if, it, if it weren't so entertaining, I would not be paying attention at all. People often uh, call me or email me friends of mine who live in the uh, the USSA, and they, they ask me, uh, what's your thought about this? And to be honest, as much as I um, have to be somewhat knowledgeable about these things for uh, for NomadCapitalist.com, for this show, etc., uh, I pay attention a lot less than I used to. I, uh, I've i told you that I was the, the kid reading you know, Jim Rogers' book and Harry Dent's book. Harry Dent will be on this show next week, by the way. Uh, but I, I was that kid. And on top of that, I was the guy who, um, you know, the year I was in college uh, and, and ever since, uh, watched the Sunday morning political talk shows in the U.S. I did all of that. And even though I was a libertarian and have continued to drift you know, further and further away from uh, believing that we need any government, uh, I, uh, I watched these things and I was uh, very informed. Now... Uh, now that I'm outside of the Western world, outside of the bankrupt United States, I don't do that anymore. And uh, let me tell you how freeing it is. Uh, the world does not, uh, the sun does not rise and set in the United States, you know. And uh, let me tell you, I used to watch these shows. I would watch, um, again, I was 15 years old, and uh, Fox News had just started coming on the air. And it was um, much more opinionated than what was on MSNBC, which at the time was just a bore fest. It was just straight news with Brian Williams delivering newscasts at 9 o'clock every night. And I was watching Hannity and Combs and Bill O'Reilly and all those guys and uh, getting all riled up as a young libertarian. And uh, let me tell you, I don't do that anymore. I don't get riled up. And Barack Obama got reelected. Good, yeah. Let it let it all crumble. It would have crumbled anyway. Might as well hasten the decline. Uh, not a fan of any of the statists. And um, this is what we talk about on this show: just how important it is to say, you know what, get out of the United States or wherever you live. If, if it's if it's Canada, uh, if it's the UK, if it's Australia, wherever it is. Distancing yourself from that and realizing that borders are not what contains you. They're not what makes you what you are. That you can write your own ticket somewhere else. I think that's very powerful. Uh, I'm not going to uh, be watching political shows now and crying in my beer over the fact that the U.S. government is a hot mess. I'm just not. First of all, I don't drink beer. But... Um, you know, listen, no one outside of the United States really cares very much. Yes, there will be some impact on global financial markets, but ultimately, just like anything else in life, places and people with solid fundamentals about them, places and people that have real backing, will not be affected, uh, forever at least. And so, in that regard, I mean, who cares what the U.S. government does with their shutdown? Let them, let the wheels fall off. 
And if you live in the United States, you have to care. But if you don't live in the United States, then you don't have to care. And um, let me tell you, it's, it's, it's interesting watching this fight from a, a long way away. Uh, just as it was interesting watching the presidential election on my iPad, I woke up at the uh, crack of dawn last uh, November when I was in Turkey. And um, uh, watching all the balloons flying out from uh, my hotel room in Cappadocia. And uh, watching Barack Obama being declared the winner, no big surprise there. And saying, yeah, look. The U.S. has uh, has decided which direction it wants to go, and who am I to stop them? Who am I to get in their way? They have, uh, you know, enough about American revival. For these people who want to revive America, I say enough. The Americans have voted; they don't want to be revived. So I wanted to get into the government shutdown. Uh, coming up on this program in just a, mo a mere moment, uh, Stefan Kinsella uh, is an attorney and liberty activist. We're going to talk to him. He's got some interesting thoughts on perpetual travel and uh, how you can uh, escape the United States if you have a family. He's a family man in uh, Texas. We'll talk about that. Uh, but let me tell you something. This government shutdown is quite something. 17% of the government is uh, shut down. 83% of it is running. Some shutdown. And... Uh, who is it impacting? Well, it's impacting people like a friend of mine who called me the other day from uh, Chicago. He was trying to uh, renew his radio station license with the Federal Communications Commission, whose website is shut down due to this, this government shutdown. Uh, so the things that the government has shut down are the parks, the websites, uh, all the things that eh, one could argue maybe kind of sort of help the citizenry. How much does it cost to run that FCC website anyway? Uh, with today's modern technology, I mean, my God, I was talking to our developer the other day who said that, um, I mean, literally nickels and dimes per, you know, per gigabyte and, and really much less than that uh, to, to run a website. I mean, it costs basically nothing to run a website. That's why everyone's doing it these days. Uh, and so the, the fact that the FCC is shutting down websites, does that mean that it's because it's a government shutdown, or that means they want you to feel the pain? I think we know the answer to that. Jeffrey Tucker was on this show months ago during the sequester, talking about how the government shuts down the Washington Monument. Let's, let's just be honest. This is how the government works. They want you to feel the pain. They want you to cry uncle, so you can give them more of your money, so you can, uh, well, they want you to allow them basically at gunpoint, to take uh, more of your money, and um, they'll do with it as they please. And um, it leads me to a very important point that I wanted to make. Uh, you know, we are now about three and a half months away from an event that I am hosting in Las Vegas. Uh, it's in Las Vegas by popular demand. Uh, the event called Passport to Freedom. And uh, Peter Schiff will be keynoting the event. We've got um, many of the people you've heard on this show who will be speaking there. Joel Nagel. Uh, there's lots of guys. It, it's all about personal sovereignty, economic sovereignty, how to build your own escape hatches around the world. And the theme of the event is fight or flight. Do you want to stay in the United States and fight? Do you want to stay there with your family? Do you want to be the guy who... Uh, who keeps the mortgage, keeps the uh, the minivan in the, in the garage, keeps the, uh, the, the private school uh, tuition, keeps all that stuff, and, and stays in the land of the free, or wherever you may be from. Or do you want to join people like myself who have chosen flight? Uh, whether it's perpetual travel, as I do, or whether it's just finding the best safe haven for you to live in, and just going there and making a new life. Uh, we're going to be covering all this information, but I think that this government shutdown is very telling. Because no one knows when this is going to be resolved. It's all politics now. And I say let them shut the whole thing down and let people realize they don't need it. That's the important lesson that people have learned here. But uh, the government being a mafia, it will rise again. We all know that. Uh, it, it, it will take a ding in its credibility, but it will rise again, uh, likely in a matter of weeks. 
But just look at how the government shutdown is being treated. Things like the FCC website being shut down is a clear indication of what's happening. We've talked before in this show about the fact that, uh, for example, going back thousands of years, government militaries, the military, which is one thing that most people, conservatives especially, but most people say, hey, the military is important. We may want to shrink it. We may want to stop the, uh, the Fakakta Wars. But, yeah, country needs a military. That's one part of government we need. But we've talked on this show how if you go back thousands of years, governments use the military just like anything else, just like the, the way they're applying the shutdown. They use it for their own purposes. The military will guard the capital first. They'll guard you later. If you're in Los Angeles, if you're in uh, Portland, if you're in Miami, if you're in the heart of the United States, they don't care about you. Sure, if something happens, they'll, they'll respond. They'll do something uh, if, if it's an isolated incident. Sure, they'll send the National Guard out if there's flooding, and they'll put the sandbags out, and they'll do all of that. But if things really hit the fan, you're going to be a sitting duck until they decide that the capital is secure. They're going to put all their resources into securing their capital. And that's just one of a number of examples that we've seen throughout history of how government is very self-serving. The so-called government shutdown, this ballyhooed shutdown that Obama is saying that people are going to be uh, falling out of trees and conking their heads open and uh, uh, children are going to be starving, the same playbook as always. Same status playbook we've heard for, I've heard for my entire life. Granny's going to die in a wheelchair. Um... That, that same playbook, it, it, all, all they're shutting down is the 17%. All they're shutting down are the things that you might actually need. And so this is why I believe that this Passport to Freedom event is so important, because things will get worse. FATCA and all the capital controls and all the other financial instruments of doom and gloom that the U.S. government is uh, legislating uh, will get worse. You'll have fewer places to put your money going forward, and the U.S. government will, in general, make things more and more difficult for you. The same way that governments throughout history have made it more difficult to escape, the more draconian the regime becomes. And so I'm not here. Look, I, you know very clear, clearly what my lifestyle is, and you can read all the different places that I report from at nomadcapitalist.com, but I don't tell people they should do what I do. If you are convinced that you have to stay in the United States, so be it. But you need to be prepared. Because the government will, uh, the next government shutdown will impact your wallet in a way that uh, you cannot dream possible. The next government shutdown, I believe, will involve massive wealth confiscation. If you think it can't happen, look at what happened in Cyprus when they shut things down. Look at what's happening in Argentina. Look at what happened in Poland. Look at what's happening all around the world. Don't, don't argue that these countries are worse or, or less civilized than your countries. How many people do you know that have talked about moving to Argentina as an example of a great bastion of freedom? A lot of Americans have done it. And here they are, siphoning off every penny from their citizenry. They did it in Cyprus, a member of the enlightened European Union. They can do it anywhere. And you're seeing how the government reacts when its back is up against a wall. They point the gun at you. They don't care about you or your needs or anything that you need or the benefits of government. It's all about maintaining power. And so at this Passport to Freedom event, uh, which you can find out more about at PassportToFreedomEvent.com, I want you to join me here because this is very important. Uh, the government will get more and more bold. They're spewing a line of BS now that is unimaginable. You never would have dreamed they could have, uh, could have gotten away with this. And the next time they do it, they'll be more empowered. Yes, their reputation is taken a ding, but at the end of the day, people have a short memory. And so the next time they do it, I believe there will be massive wealth confiscation. And if you're not prepared, you'll be a victim. So PassportToFreedomEvent.com, get your ticket for our event in Las Vegas. I want to see you there. You can go to the website and see all the speakers. Like I said, Peter Schiff will be there. He is an outspoken guy on these topics, how to protect yourself, how to protect your money, where are the safe havens. 
and over a dozen other experts. But the bottom line is, we will be discussing where are the safe havens. Stuff we don't talk about in this show, stuff we don't talk about on the website. Stuff that will be inner circle secrets, only for people who believe that they need to be at this event. So you need to get your ticket now, because the early bird special that we're running will not last forever. Most people wait until the last minute to get their ticket, and they will pay a lot more than you do if you buy right now. I, I don't know of any events, really, that are more affordable than our events. So go to PassportToFreedomEvent.com. That's PassportToFreedomEvent.com. Passport, the word two, T-O, FreedomEvent.com. Get your ticket today, and uh, make sure the next government shutdown does not hurt your pocketbook or your family. Coming up next, Stefan Consala. We're going to talk to him about liberty, the art of perpetual travel, and more. I'm Andrew Henderson, nomadcapitalist.com. We will return. Andrew Henderson, NomadCapitalist.com. This is the Nomad Capitalist Report. Stefan Kinsella is uh, with me. He's the editor of Libertarian Papers, a libertarian writer and attorney uh, in the land of the free in Houston, uh, talking about uh, so many issues. And I want to delve into this, some some theoretical stuff, but also I want to discuss with him uh, the pros and cons of living a nomad lifestyle. And uh, can it be done? Can you do it with a family? Uh, and that, uh, but uh, Stefan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Andrew. Well, let's start with this because you are a lawyer and you've written uh, books, and I mean you've got a, 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 a quite a publishing uh, history. Uh, one of the things that I hear you talking about with a lot of people, and on your own site, you've interviewed Lou Rockwell, and you're all over the place, is IP, intellectual property. Uh, yes. I'm, an, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm with you in the. The freedom boat, the anarcho-capitalist boat, the let's get um, the government. Uh, let's just shut. The, forget about the seventeen percent shutdown. Let's just let's just shut the whole thing down. But I want you to explain because I think this is a very awakening moment for the entrepreneur who thinks that they're entirely pro freedom, but maybe there's a little bit of statism in there in them. Talk about your argument against intellectual property. I find this fascinating. Well, I'm a patent attorney. IP attorney. I've done it for about 20 years now, so I'm well versed in you know how the system works and what people think about it and how they navigate the system. Um, quite a while ago, I came to the conclusion that intellectual property, primarily patent and copyright law, um, which are seen widely as aspects of a private Western capitalist pro-property rights you know, free market feature, um, I came to realize that they were completely contrary to those things. Um, so everyone is used to certain features of modern society. They're used to taxes, they're used to war, they're used to the drug war, they're used to regulations, they're used to bribes and graft and voting and politics. Wait, and wait, 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 there's no bri- there's no graft in the United States, that, please. That's only in the no, third world legal. countries. It's, it's all legal. Oh, right, of right. course. All right, go ahead. You're right. So, um, you know, I, it's basically the idea that intellectual property, if you call something a property right, it must be property, right? Because the people who they call it that are experts. Um, and so, just like you. Go ahead. No, please continue. No, I was just going to say, you know, the, the idea is that just like you are a producer of, I don't know, let's say cars or. Or, or you know a, a chest that you make from wood, or some kind of object that you sell on the market. That also the objects of your intellect that you create, like poems or novels or movies or music, recordings, lyrics, etc., paintings. These things are also objects of commerce that should be the subject of property rights. 
and because the government system has labeled them property rights, we must consider them to be property rights. So my view came to be that there's a fundamental fallacy here, which is number one, relying upon what the government says. You can never trust the state. Um, there's always an ulterior motive. The, the fundamental problem is that patent and copyright are basically government legislated legal privileges that attempt to they're, – well, they're based upon censorship of ideas and monopolized control of, of commerce and industry. And the idea that we modern advocates of freedom, individualism, free markets, private property would hold these things up as aspects of the private property order is literally, to my mind, obscene because they are the actual anathema of private property rights. In fact, what I would say is the following. If you, if you just want to list like off your hand the worst things the state does to society… Okay, you have war, taxes, government education, right? Central banking, the drug war. These things are all horrible, and they're hard to get rid of. And we know that. But at least libertarians realize that they are all contrary to property rights, and at least we know that we're, that that's what we're fighting against. But if you take if you take the very next worst thing the government does, which is intellectual property, which is patent and copyright law. And to my mind, it's up there with all these other things I just mentioned. It's up there with inflation, central banking, the drug war, uh, regulation of business, taxation, government education and propaganda, and real war. The difference is that it masquerades under the title of property rights. So unlike the others, which at least are identifiable by us as clear evils of the state, intellectual property – confuses and discombobulates libertarians and free market advocates because we think, well, we're in favor of property rights. How can we be against this kind of property right? So in a way, it's the worst evil of all that's perpetuated by the state because it's insidious. Well, that's what the government is – that the state has really uh, – you know, they've morphed over the years. The tactics haven't changed. The desperation hasn't changed. But I think that governments in the U.S. in particular have become experts at marketing it. So I agree with you on that, and I agree with you on crony capitalism. Just look what's happening now in California with ride-sharing companies, for example, where the big entrenched crony capitalists in the taxi business get up and say uh, people shouldn't be able to drive their friends around. I shouldn't be able to drive you around Houston uh, in exchange for a fee if you need a ride. Crony capitalism, of course, alive and well in uh, in the United States. But let me play devil's advocate because you are an attorney. Uh, I'm a big fan of the TV show The Shark Tank. You hear people like Kevin O'Leary saying that these little businesses are going to get crushed by a cockroach. And the one salvation that some of these businesses have is that they can go out and invent something, get a patent on it, and prevent Apple or Walmart or whomever else from coming in and ripping them off and stomping on them like said cockroach. What do you say to that? Well, first of all, I would agree with you. My, my favorite show on TV is The Shark Tank. It's probably the best show uh, on television. And one of the sharks is Mark Cuban, and he actually has used some of his wealth to endow a chair at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a chair called something like uh, the, the Mark Cuban Chair to Eliminate Stupid Patents. So I'm actually on Mark Cuban's side of this issue. Um I don't think Kevin O'Leary and the other guys are wrong to ask about IP rights given our system. You know, it would be like saying, you know, if you're trying to uh, sell a utility system to a to a municipality in an American town, what are your connections with the government? Given our system, you know, the reality is you're going to succeed only if you have certain connections. And given our IP system, the reality is you're only going to succeed if you have a certain a savvy IP strategy, which means you're acquiring patents, you're doing deals, you have attorneys who are advising you, etc. Um, the problem is not how people respond to the system. You know, th this is like criticizing the welfare system because people take advantage of it. The problem with welfare is not that people will, you know. You, you, you have a welfare system and you say, if you sign up, if you qualify, we will give you free money, free goods. The problem is not that people respond to that. 
In fact, you couldn't expect them not to respond to it. Of course. If, if no one responded to it, then it would, we wouldn't have an objection to the system in the first place. The fact is that people do respond to it. So the problem is the system in the first place, not the, the fact that people respond to it. It's the same thing with intellectual property like patent and copyright. Given our current system where you have patents, you're going to have companies have a natural incentive to hire attorneys like me to acquire patents – which they can use either aggressively or defensively in this big, huge, uh, wasteful game of uh, patent battles against each other. What it results in is oligopolies because you have large companies amass patent fortunes. They can sue each other and sue small companies. Their fellow victims that are large can counter with their own patent portfolios, and they can reach a settlement like a decant. Okay? So it's like an armistice. It's like the large countries have a lock on the world's legal systems and the ruling system. Like we have roughly 200 countries in the world. It's the same thing in certain industries like the smartphone industry. Apple, Samsung, Google, these other country, companies, they all have thousands of patents, and they use them to fight each other. And they can finally come to a detente settlement, and they will finally do that after paying hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of legal fees to attorneys, which they can afford because they're, they're the incumbent large companies. But what it does is it erects barriers to entry to smaller companies. So these patent monopolies lead to oligopolies and cartelized industries. And then the state steps in and says, oh, well, we can't have uh, you know, a monopoly system in this area, so we're going to apply our antitrust laws. So we have the government basically helping to cartelize and oligopolize industry because of its patent grants, its monopoly patent grants. And then to fix the problem that it helps to cause, it's going to apply its mono- anti-monopoly laws. Well, so and, we what have- you, and what you look at right now is the example of uh, everyone talking about the healthcare <laughs> exchanges in the United States and – uh, compare that to, you know, what, what would Ayn Rand say? What would you say about Apple? You don't have to buy an iPad. But when you look at it a different way, Apple, as the oligopoly that you're talking about, or as, you know, one of the behemoth companies that's out there, and they, they are participating in crony capitalism, but part of what they're doing is applying for patents that, uh, well, for example, can uh, perhaps uh, disable your smartphone from taking pictures or doing whatever else uh, in you know, political rallies. And they're creating technologies. You could say, okay, well, their technologies, how they're used is one thing. But certainly they have to uh, maintain a position in bed with the state, and their state is perhaps the most oppressive, uh, effectively oppressive government on earth. Uh, what do you say about companies like Apple and, and, uh, and what they're doing with some of their patents? Well, it's a difficult situation because, I mean, I think uh, in an absolute term, what Apple is doing is um, is a horrible injustice. But on the other hand, they're playing the game. You can't really blame them for playing the game. You have you know, directors and managers of Apple. They're responsible to the shareholders. The shareholders want to you know, maximize their, 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 uh, their share value. So how do you do that? You have to take advantage of every market opportunity you have or every opportunity you have to make a profit. And under the existing regulations and laws – so let's say Apple acquires 5,000, 10,000 patents, which it has to do to be responsible. If it doesn't do that, it's left naked in defense from competitors. So every company has an incentive to waste millions and millions of dollars on people like me. To acquire patents. Now, once you have this patent arsenal, what are you going to do with it? You're sitting on an asset. It could be used defensively, but it could also be used offensively. So let's say you're on the board of directors of Apple or you're the CEO you know, or one of the top managers, and you become aware that there's a competitor like Samsung or Motorola or Google or whatever who is manufacturing a product that – is allegedly infringing one of your millions or thousands of patents. And if you enforce this patent, you could get a big market advantage worth, let's say, uh, let's just say $300 billion, okay? A third of a trillion dollars, okay? Now, if you are on the board of directors of Apple, what are you supposed to do? Say, look, I am a libertarian. I don't believe in patents. So I'm going to say, I recommend that we 
we tell the shareholders you should give up one third of the value of your shares to enforce the you know the moral idea of libertarianism. It's just unrealistic to expect that. If you do that, you're going to be sued or going to be fired at best. I you know I recall saying it maybe 13 years old. Uh, you know why? Why would can I was first you know wanting to start businesses? Why would you run and run a publicly traded company and be responsible to these people? But you're you're exactly right. And so as a small business owner, obviously you do have the freedom to to put up the signs on your door like we see on the internet where it says, "Hey, uh, government employees not welcome here." Personally, as a business owner, it it bothers me a little bit that uh, that people would would throw away money like that. The best thing to do to people you don't like is to take their money. But that's their freedom, and it's a freedom, unfortunately, that the cronies who uh, have to answer to shareholders don't have. What, what I wonder, uh, Stephen Consala, uh, is uh, isn't this just a justification – and we'll talk about this when we come back – isn't this just a justification for what we talk about here, that maybe the system, while not perfect elsewhere, has become broken beyond repair in the United States? Uh, I'm happy to talk about that. I'm Andrew Henderson. We'll come back with uh, Stephen Consala. His website, stephanconsala.com, author, editor at libertarianpapers.com. This is the Nomad Capitalist Report. I'm Andrew Henderson. This is the Nomad Capital Report. Stefan Kinsella with me from stephankinsella.com. Uh, Libertarian Papers is also his website. He's uh, a, a multi-decade libertarian uh, patent attorney and expert in uh, so many of these issues. But uh, what I wanted to get into, uh, you and I were talking about SOPA and PIPA and all these laws that the U.S. is trying to use to basically reward their cronies in Hollywood and the music business. Uh, and you now see a new threat that just like FATCA tried to do with banking, the U.S. tried to make every other country and every world bank the, uh, the bitch of the IRS. You're saying it's now coming with IP. Tell us more. So here's how I look at it. I mean, most – it's ironic a little bit that most libertarians you know, come from the U.S., right? So the, the – the libertarian movement originates in America. So there's a libertarian sentiment here. And ironically, the U.S. is the most imperialist and activist country around. When, when Murray Rothbard mentioned this in the 60s, 70s, you know, he got attacked by the Randians who were very patriotic, pro-American. Like George Reisman in his capitalism book just attacked Rothbard uh, for saying this kind of stuff. Um, but the truth is it's not surprising. What you have is you have a large country which has an internal free market, which is the U.S., and therefore this large country generates a large amount of wealth, which is good for the people. But if you have a state in control, which we do, which every country does, the state then can parasite off of that and become very wealthy and powerful. So this explains why the U.S. government – has been for you know a good century now the most powerful influential you know super state on the face well, of well, the well, earth. Let's, let's explain one thing, Stephen. I mean, there's 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 one major reason why that's the case. And you look at uh, you know we just passed Columbus Day not long ago, and uh, you hear everyone talking about oh this new world was discovered, and look at what happened. Well, the United States garnered how much of this power by the fact that it had a very simple policy of uh, murdering and manipulating anyone who got in its way on its path to make it all the way to the next ocean. If it were just, hey, we got a couple colonies here, we're going to hang out on the eastern seaboard, it would be a nothing burger like everything else. But because of a genocidal policy or this imperialism that you speak of, that's why. Doesn't that speak to exactly what you're talking about? No, exactly. I agree completely with you. I read, I read your post on uh, why we call ourselves America, and I agree completely with this jingoism and this uh, nationalism and this – this uh, 
this modern American perspective on things. Um, that's why I said you have to have two things combined. You have to have a large country, which is also has an internal free market. So you have other countries that have free markets, which are small, you know, Liechtenstein, maybe Hong Kong, I don't know, but they're, they're small, uh, even Canada, right? Uh, but so America has the combination. It's the largest with a big free market internally. But when you have the combination, you have a state that can parasitically take by taxes and other, uh, other means resources from this healthy, prosperous free market beast. Right now, yes, we could have gotten this big if we hadn't uh, killed the Indians and become imperialistic, etc. But this is just another symptom of the fact that we're imperialistic in general. So the U.S., you know, tries to use its dominant force in the world, which has been dominant since World War II, if not earlier, to impose its wishes on the rest of the world through treaties like the Berne Convention, the WTO, GATT, the United Nations. Uh, various treaties uh, and arrangements, right? The dollar is the world preserved currency, Bretton Woods, the whole deal. Um, it, it may be crumbling now, it may be getting harder to enforce. It's always a dynamic shifting thing, right? But the point is, at the behest of special interest groups like the pharmaceutical industry, like the uh, software industry, like Hollywood and the music industry, which are all heavily dependent upon patent or copyright, intellectual property rights. Um, I mean, basically, the America, United States of America, is the country that is most dominated by the IP industry in the world. It's really to the disadvantage of, of almost every other country to increase their IP regimes. And so you're saying so the U.S. is basically going to thrust its its weight upon these other countries and force them, like it does with everything else, force them to cooperate. Although I don't really know if that's uh, – I mean when you, when you get out of the U.S. and you look at many of these places, uh, there's not so much enforcement in many of these places. Uh, it's pretty weak. They can sign on to whatever they want, but uh, enforcement can be very lax. Yeah, but it's been, it's been ratcheting up every year for the last, say, 20 years, and it's getting worse and worse. And every country that signs on to the – to the WIPO Treaty, the Berne Convention, GATT, and now the, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is coming up. They are going to be agreeing – Like, so, so let me give you an example. Right now, the Berne Convention, which was passed in the 80s, I believe, requires every country to have a minimum copyright standard of life of the author plus 50 years, which is insane, right? And which is far greater than the original copyright idea, which is 14 years. Used to be fourteen years, maybe fourteen times two, twenty-eight years. Now it's life of the author plus fifty years. That's the minimum standards you have to meet if you're a member of the Berne Convention, which is pretty much universal. And in fact, the U.S. foisted that on the country and the world. And now, if when people say we need to reform the copyright standard and maybe go down to, let's say, twenty years, whatever, the U.S. says, "Well, we can't do that because we have an international obligation to <laughs> respect Berne." So they've kind of hand you know, handcuffed themselves on purpose. But but the point is, that's the minimum standard. The U.S. But by by virtue of Sonny Bono, remember share Sonny Bono in the nineteen uh, I think eighties or nineties extended the terms even more by twenty more years. It was called the Copyright Term Extension Act. It was done at the behest of Disney and the Mickey Mouse lobby. To make sure Mickey Mouse didn't go into the public domain. So now in the U.S., the minimum term is life of the author plus 70 years. Okay, But every other country, now we have a difference. So it could be that very soon some Beatles songs will become public domain very soon or, or at a certain point in Britain before they become public domain in America, even though they're a British band. So you have these bizarre things. So you have American – the American government twisting the arms of other countries like Russia, China, India, Japan. Which, which, Canada, which, which is no surprise. That it, and, and I understand the guys on the Shark Tank and the VC guys will continue to invest wherever they think they can make money. They'll go to Cyprus. They'll go to wherever, and that's fine. Uh, but uh, let's be honest. Uh, I, as, a, as an individual, have said, no, I will not do business in the state of California. I wonder why some s larger company does not say, no, it's not worth running a store or our grocery chain or whatever else in the state of California. And I think eventually that mindset, what, it's kind of the four-minute mile effect. Once someone successfully 
uh, takes extracts themselves from the United States and says there's plenty of money to be made in China, plenty of money to be made in Russia and all these other economies. We can do it without the U.S. Things maybe will start to change. And so thank God that Russia and China are two big examples of places that don't have this nonsense and that maybe could fight back. Uh, but it leads me, um, Stephen Kinsala, to the question, aren't we just, and we got about five minutes, you and I have a friendly disagreement on, doesn't this just mean you just you should just pack up and just say sayonara? Well, the question is, where do you go to? You know, not, not everyone can just pack up and go. They have commitments, they have families. They do, you, have, do you agree with Ronald Reagan that this is the, if we don't protect freedom here, it's all over and the world goes nuclear? Obviously, I don't. No, you don't. No, no, I don't agree with Ronald Reagan on that. No, I don't think America's special, actually. Um, they happen to be dominant in some ways right now. I hope you never run for no. politi- political office down there. I hope you never turn attorney into uh, a, I know you're not a statist, but uh, don't, don't have a change of heart because that's the line right there. America's not special. Well, you'll, you'll be buried right there, one line. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't vote, so I wouldn't run for office. Good. Uh, so, so no, uh, no, I'm totally opposed to all that jingoism and all, all that crap. Uh, America is unique in some ways. It has a different concept of identity. Um, to be an American means to be a citizen, whereas to be an Italian means to be an Italian. There's a difference, right? I mean, and that's good in some ways and bad in some ways. Uh, for example, immigra- large immigration here, I think, would be obviously beneficial to the country. Whereas, you know, if you open the borders in Switzerland or France, what would happen? It's a little bit different situation because they're more ethnically, nationally homogenous and and sort of oriented. So there's differences around the around the world, and that's that's uh, you know, there's no there's no shame in admitting that. But no, I don't think America's special. I hope that we become less dominant in the world. I hope that America's role becomes one more one of many than the dominant voice. You don't believe that people have somewhere to go, though. You don't believe that it's it's as easy as just saying, you know what, I don't want to be here. Well, I've, I've heard people like you. I am glad people like you are out there. I haven't looked into detail because of my personal situation. Um, I have a. I hope that you're right and that it that there's somewhere there's something you can do but it feels to me like every every option is fraught with difficulty like yeah there are something there's something better about moving to mexico or moving to the philippines or moving to vietnam or moving to new zealand or whatever or getting a second passport but there's also costs involved so nothing is unambiguously an obvious choice and and the reason is because the the state really is has succeeded in this modern age. I don't think they'll be around forever, but at the present time, I don't think we can deny that the state does impose costs on us. You, you believe that the state is basically knowingly manipulating the fact that uh, people want to go and see uh, uh, people want to go and see a nanny on uh, or a pappy on Sunday, and so therefore they will not go, and they'll continue to pay whatever uh, ransom the government demands. They'll continue to uh, be happy to have their crotch groped when they go to fly and see pappy. You're saying that the state manipulates that. Well, I would say knowingly because when we talk about the state as a metaphor in a sense, right, the state is not an independent entity that exists. It's a way of conceptually classifying a sort of hierarchical organization in society that has a sort of uh, mission of its own. It's composed of individuals, but I don't think all the individuals that constitute it are aware of what it's doing. Well, but, but, but Chuck Schumer, when Chuck Schumer promotes an act that says if you renounce your U.S. citizenship – and in he in his infinite wisdom on the toilet one day decides that it was because of tax purposes that you could never come back. Isn't that designed to basically say, look at everything you'll be missing. You won't be able to get 49 cent drinks anymore at the, at the, at the, 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 the QT. Isn't that what it is? Isn't that about trying to prey on people's fears? Oh, what if I can never go back to the United States? And, and you, well, it, I don't think it's just – it's not just preying on their fears. It's preying up on – it's really taking advantage of what they value. Basically, you're, you're coercing them. What they're saying is we know that you were born. In the U.S., you have context here. You have a history here. You love your country, right? Or you're, maybe not your maybe, state. Maybe, maybe, your I, yeah, maybe sometimes. Yeah. And they're saying that you know, if you, we're, the price of keeping this is that you have to abide by our rules. So yeah, they use that to manipulate people. I think it's totally intentional. I I, just, I agree completely with that, and it's totally evil, and it's totally cynical, and it's totally dishonest and manipulative. But they can get away with it to a certain extent now because, and to the extent 
that people accept the myth that the state is necessary. I'm with you, although I also believe that you know there has to come a time, people like you and I, who believe that, listen, nobody owes you anything. There's a time when the people who want to join us can join us and we'll support them and we'll be there and we'll provide them what they need and we can network and, and be a resource. But there comes a time when, when the building is burning down and we can only take so many people. And if you want to stay and you want to run around inside the building you know, looking f to, to take things out with you and looking to, to not help us, we can only do so much. And that, uh, listen, there is a cost to doing these things. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, it may not be perfect, but are you, you know, what are you fighting for? What do you stand for? Uh, there are ways, I, I think that there are ways to get around it, but I, I appreciate your opinion. Uh, Stefan Kinsella, StefanKinsella.com is the website. He also edits the Libertarian Papers uh, website and, uh, works with all the guys in this, uh, anarcho-capitalist field, Lou Rockwell, uh, all the way on down. Jeffrey Tucker, a friend of our show, so, uh. Uh, Stefan, thanks for being on the show. No, I agree. There's only so much we can do. Um, we fight for liberty as best we can, and I think as long as we're united in our fight for uh, truth, justice, honesty, integrity with each other, we live by virtues that we all know in our hearts are the right virtues to live by. And we have to just keep an open eye, you know, uh, have a perspective on what the government really is about, what the state's about. Um, that's all we can do in our individual lives, L live the best lives we can, set an example for other people and try to keep an open mind when we talk to fellow minded people, even if we have different uh, ideas. And I appreciate yours and I appreciate the, the, the chance to, to speak with you. Stefan Kinsella, uh, his website and also his podcast. Check out his podcast as well online. Thanks for being on the show. This is the Nomad Capitals Report. <laughs>